Good morning and welcome to this, uh, the first of the virtual bridge sessions for 2021. Happy New Year. And it's the 103rd session overall. And we're pleased to come back to an area which is of a significant interest at the moment, and that's making sure that you are confident in using other people's stuff when delivering online and making good use of the exceptions that are provided for in copyright legislation. Um, so we have our uh, resident experts uh, coming back Back to give a session and so it's over to Alan Ray. Thanks very much uh, Jason, it's lovely to see everybody this morning. It is a nice day here in Dundee, I hope it's nice where you are uh, and I do wish you, I, I don't, I'm, not con, I'm not happy wishing people a happy new year under the circumstances, let's just say it's going to be a, a better, improved, different, changed year. Uh, anyway, I, I do wish you all good wishes. I'm delighted to be asked back to present yet another session on my very favourite topic that hasn't changed over the years. And uh, I, as, as Jason said, I'm going to do a presentation this morning on exceptions. I'm assuming a little bit of prior knowledge, but not too much. But I will try to explain things as I go through. It's uh, for me very short, so plenty of time at the end, I hope, for questions if anybody has them. So without any further ado, I will share my screen. Uh, 20,000, or 2021, 20,000, 2021, resolved to make it an exceptional, an exceptional year. It's been a, a concern of mine for a long time that in colleges in particular, uh, and in education in general, we're not fully aware of the benefits that do accrue to us from the Copyright Designs and Patents Act of 1988. There are a number of exceptions in it which are ex really helpful to us. So here I am, I'm Alan Ray, I'm a copyright consultant, have been for a long time now, I had 34 years in Scottish further education, um, all of it in Dundee in various guises, Dundee College of Commerce, right up to um, I think I was out just before Dundee and Angus became a thing. Yeah, I was. And I've had 32 years of copyright experience because I picked up on this when I was head of audiovisual at the old Dundee College of Further Education uh, back in 1988. So the takeaway for today, I hope, is that you will have a, an improved understanding of copyright exceptions and more importantly, or as importantly, a willingness to apply these exceptions. Unfortunately, the perceptions of copyright still linger, that, they, that it can be boring, complicated, scary, outdated. We wonder about the relevance of it sometimes because we uh, are constantly told we're living in a copy culture and nobody really cares about it anymore. But my goodness me, you really do have to care about it. These, uh, the perceptions, unfortunately, do lead to fear, ignorance, apathy, but you do ignore it at your peril. And with our lives uh, constantly in turmoil these days, particularly in education, and the move to blended learning, one has to be aware of copyright and what it allows you to do or not to do. So, in my opinion, there is no need for fear because within the terms of the Copyright Designs and Patents Act, we have the wonderful chapter three. Now, we don't need to know about the detail of that too much. But what it does talk about are acts permitted in relation to copyright works. As you're perhaps aware, copyright works are literary, dramatic, musical, artistic, sound recordings, um, moving images, films, um, and broadcasts and a few other things thrown in for good, good measure. So the chapter three sections cover these areas in copyright. Now, the ones I want to deal with this morning, obviously, are general and education. But that's not to say that you should not ignore the others. There is exceptionally good, excuse me, pardon me, range of disability exceptions very good range of libraries and archives and more recently we've we've had um, a lot of work done on orphan works those works where we can't track down who 
manages the rights to the work anymore, be it the publisher, the creator, um, or a licensing agency. But as I say, I'm going to concentrate this morning on general and education. So, as I've said, all these sections provide exceptions. There are always exceptions to a rule, and copyright, thankfully, is no different. There are one or two challenges that we need to consider, though, with regards to the exceptions, which work in our favour, and that's why I've put challenges benefits there. There is a distinct lack of definition, there is a distinct lack of interpretation, and there is um, a lack of example. Now, whether or not the drafters of the legislation intended this or not, I have a suspicion that they did, because uh, so much legislation is open to interpretation and is then interpre interpreted by the courts. Now, thankfully, there, there, is, there is a lot of case law in, in copyright, I can't deny that, but there's not a massive amount of case law when it comes to the interpretation of exceptions, particularly those within education. And uh, my view is that if you are risk aware, rather than risk averse, and you do have a slight feeling of adventure about you when it comes to creating teaching and learning resources, the exceptions are there for you to benefit what it is that you want to do. Now, I know, I've, I apologize, some of you have maybe seen this before. It's not a great slide, there are far too many words on it, but it is important, I think, that people see this and understand it. This was the impact assessment in 2012, a long time ago now, that the Intellectual Property Office put out prior to the amendments in the education exceptions, which came into force in October 2014. Now, being the person I am and in the, the job that I do, I would highlight those particular aspects that I feel are of benefit for uh, my sector. The statement is to amend the copyright exceptions for education, fair enough, so that copyright does not unduly restrict education and teaching. And then it goes on to emphasize the widening of the current exceptions, applying them to more types of creative works and more kinds of technology. Prior to the um, introduction of the amended exceptions in 2014, each form of work, be it artistic, literary, dramatic, and so on, it had varying, uh, various um, exceptions applied to them, and it got very confusing. An exception that you could apply perhaps to a literary work, you couldn't apply to an artistic work. This was the end of all of that, thankfully, and across the board, until we are told differently, we can use all the exceptions with all types of works. And again, we don't have case law to prevent this, but you can use, in my opinion, and I think the opinion of many more learned people than myself, you can use the exceptions within each other. So you're not restricted. You, you, it's not a question of you can only use this exception in this way. You can cross use them if that's not a bad term. So the point is to make it easier to use copyright works in education, particularly with the modern technology, in order to enrich and enhance the learning environment. And just at the end there, there was the little bit about reducing the risks associated with using copyright materials when delivering education. Because without mentioning too many names or organisations, some people connected with copyright would prefer you to think that there are quite a lot of risks and um, reasons for you not wanting to mess about with copyright. But as I say, no names, no pack drill. So that impact statement, in my opinion, enables copyright exceptions. And the statement shows an intent to remove hurdles, to remove the copyright hurdles, making it easier to use copyright in education and reducing the risks associated. Now, this all comes down to an aspect, a much maligned aspect of copyright called fair dealing. And again, apologies if you've heard me before and I noticed some names in the list of people that I know well. 
Fair dealing is the UK term. Fair use is the American term for this flexibility that we're given with the use of certain works uh, under copyright. Uh, fair use tends to be much more flexible in America. But unfortunately, because of Americanisms, so many people in this country now quote fair use, and that is a confusion. However, fair dealing, interestingly, it's not easy to work with sometimes. It's a legal term, as it says on the screen, to establish whether a use of copyright material is lawful or whether it infringes copyright. Now, the important part from our uh, perspective is there is no statutory definition of fair dealing. It will always be a matter of fact, degree and impression. Now, this uh, leads on to some myths in copyright about, oh, you can only copyright this. If you adjust this much, uh, you're OK. You'll get away with that. You can change the notes in music and so on and so forth. We've heard them all. It all comes down to a matter of fact, degree and impression. And there are cases where judges have said, yes, it's OK to copy a substantial amount of a book. Uh, in other cases, no, you can't copy that at all because um, just even a few pages um, cause a big problem. You know, they are an essential part of the book, so there's more value to that uh, aspect of the book. So, from our point of view, for the exceptions, the dealing is fair. And this, well, I'll highlight the actual section just in a moment. The dealing is fair, according to our law, when the copying is for a non-commercial purpose. Sorry, this is exceptions in education. When the copying is for a non-commercial purpose, got to be careful there because colleges operate both on commercial and non-commercial uh, areas. But again, there is a lack of definition here. Uh, the dealing is fair when it's done by a person giving or receiving instruction. Again, it's not strictly defined. Other aspects of copyright talk about, or other aspects of copyright law talk about authorised persons, and that covers pretty much everybody who is employed or studying at a school, college or university. So my interpretation is still authorised persons, so it's students, staff, whether teaching, support, admin, so on. The dealing is fair when copying is accompanied by a sufficient acknowledgement. Now that really should be a matter of course that if you quote somebody else's work, you give them a citation so that people know that it's not your work and you are actually referring to the place that you have taken the, um, the resource from in the first place or have used their work to create your resource. And I would note, ask you to note that the giving and receiving of instruction does include exams. Uh, again, ill-defined. It doesn't go into detail about formative and summative assessment or anything like that at all. So from my point of view, you take the broad approach and it says exams, depends upon what your interpretation of exams is. I just want to highlight a couple of the um, exceptions. This is a general one, section 29, research and private study. And I've argued long and hard as, as a number of us on this call have done over the years with one of the education uh, licensing agencies in particular uh, who claim that you need their license for any kind of copying. You don't. You need it for multiple copying. You don't need it for single copying. And in this day and age, this digital day and age of links and um, um, hyperlinks addresses and so on, I have no problem personally, and I would stand up and defend in court, and I should have said right at the very start of this, I'm not a solicitor, so please, you can't, um, you can't sue me. <laughs> I can try and come and help you if need be. But uh, I would stand up and try to defend anybody. Uh, sorry, that was not supposed to happen. I was supposed to go back the way. Oh, I'm going forward. I keep forgetting how to go backwards. Never mind. Um, here we go. Previous. And... You see how good I am at digital. It's unbelievably bad. Um, I'm getting there. Just bear with me, sorry. Right, to go back to section 29, research and private study. This is a general exception 
it's not within the educational areas, but that's not to say we can't use it. We're, we're not confined just to the educational ones. And again, that's something I would ask you to bear in mind that within the law, yes, there's a nice little group of exceptions for education, but there are even better ones elsewhere or just as good uh, exceptions elsewhere that we can tap into. And it's this lack of knowledge of this, unfortunately, that um, holds us back a bit, I think. So single copies can be made by learners. Learners can reference links. Copying by the learner must still comply with fair dealing, but that again comes back to it must be non-commercial. It must be done by a teacher or a, a student or a you know um, an authorized person in the staff, and you must give an acknowledgement. It's not a lot to have to do. It's not a lot to consider. It's not a burden. Section 32, illustration for instruction. When we, well, certainly when I first saw this, and I think the view was shared by many people in October 9, uh, 2014, when we saw it actually in print. Uh, the, the fair, it says, fair dealing with a work for the sole purpose of illustration for instruction does not infringe copyright in the work. Now you think, wow, that's fantastic. There are a lot of caveats, unfortunately. You are prevented from copying where there is already an existing license, and that takes us to the realms of CLA, ERA, and the music licensors. And I don't want to get hung up on them today. I don't have time, unfortunately, um, because it's, it's so easy to get bogged down in that. But fair dealing with a work for the sole purpose of illustration for instruction does not infringe copyright in the work. And let's just think about that for a moment. Illustration for instruction is not defined. Fair, de fair dealing is not defined other than what I've already shown you in a previous slide. So my interpretation or an interpretation of section 32, I tried to keep this as wide as possible, is that I can interpret section 32 to mean that you can copyright track or tracks from a CD onto a VLE, passages from a DVD onto a VLE, passages of non-CLA licensed content, and by, um, by transmission then, passages from non-ERA licensed content, from non-NLA media access licensed content, and the music licenses. Uh, and I would throw in here a personal viewpoint. I personally think that colleges can do without an NLA and music licenses. I don't think they're necessary anymore, particularly if you're only using music uh, in the um, in the curriculum. If, if you're using music in the curriculum, you certainly don't need the licenses because you're covered. NLA, yes, there's an argument. CLA, there's a big argument, but we're trying to get involved in those arguments at the moment. So I think you can do all that kind of copying. I would add the warning, fair dealing, and it has to be for the curriculum. No posting on any public facing media because that's death. If you go down that road, you are asking for trouble. But again, it comes down to how you and your college feels about this. Are you risk aware, risk averse, or are you feeling creative? So in summary, comply with fair dealing. My view is that we either use or lose the exceptions. It won't uh, surprise you to know that constantly the authors, the publishers, I, quite rightly, I, I probably, if I were siding with them, I would be um, lobbying for this as well, that um, the government rescinds some of the exceptions because they are too damaging to the, the livelihood of the authors and creators. And um, yeah, well, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's true. We, we did already lose one of the exceptions. Not long after 2014, we lost the exception thanks to massive lobbying from the record companies of the exception, the general exception, that we could make private copies of CDs for our own purposes. And please tell me, I, I don't know how many people use CDs these days. I very rarely play them. I'm just using streaming music most of the time. But uh, I know that CDs still exist and various other media still exist. And uh, I don't think that the loss of that exception has stopped that particular um, activity. The times are changing. That is a massive understatement, given what we're going through at the moment, what's just happened in America. Um, learning and teaching are changing. 
being forced on us to an extent by uh, the pandemic. Learners' expectations are changing. I, I could guarantee you, without any doubt whatsoever, being the crumbly age that now I am now, if I were to go into a college and try to interact or engage with students, which I do do, I'm still happy to do that, to uh, talk with them about copyright and how it affects their lives and their future careers. But I know that their expectations are entirely different from the expectations of my students 30 odd, 40, a long time ago, years ago. Um, it's a digital age. Students uh, learn in different ways now. They're much more visually literate than they were in my day. And uh, yeah, so we've got to take all of that into account. And the exceptions are there. That, that um, impact statement indicated that we have to move with the times. And to help us and to help you, if you have a copyright policy guidance and training, it will help you massively to mitigate the risks that's why some colleges in Scotland, and we may have, I didn't check the full attendance list, but some of you may already have moved on from one or two of the collecting licenses. Um, you can do that with the, the basis that if you have a, if you have um, the copyright policy and so on in place. Now, just to finish off, all of these are options these days where you can use the exceptions, you might not have to use the exceptions, they're already there for you. Uh, the licenses, sorry, the, these um, offerings may come with specific licenses, always worth reading the license, particularly if you're having trouble sleeping. But uh, yeah, always have a look at them just to be on the safe side. Obviously a big shout out there for JISC who have got a tremendous number of, God, I sounded like Donald Trump there, tremendous, uh, have a lot significant selection of um, e-resources for you to use. YouTube, YouTube massive amount of materials that people can use. Whether or not you um, can um, stick with the provenance of the materials, it's another matter, but that's again where expectations have moved on. In my day, there was lots of citations, lots of book uh, lists and so on. Nowadays, here's a number of links that I'd like you to go and look at. Come back to me when you've watched that movie. We'll have a chat about it, or we'll, um, or we'll, we'll have a, I'll set you a test or an exam. Sorry. How dare somebody try to call me? Sorry about that. It's not going well this morning. Anyway, these are all well worth looking at. Interesting that uh, BBC have come very much to the fore in the last week, uh, offering a massive amount of, um, keep using massive, uh, a large amount of resources to help in blended learning. And then you've got these plate, these as well to, to consider. Uh, all my images this morning are all from Pixabay. YouTube talked about TED. Oh God, how I wish I'd had TED when I was teaching. And then interesting that iTunes U, I don't know if any of you use that, but I note that it's, um, it's uh, being withdrawn at the end of 2021, but no doubt there'll be plenty other um, other things coming out to take its place. So thank you for your attention. Sorry, it's rambled a bit this morning, more so than usual. I am Alan Ray, my passion is for copyright, and that is very sad. Don't hesitate to contact me. Do have an exceptional 2021. As I've said, images are from Pixabay, and I license all my work, virtually all my work these days, uh, on a CC BY license from Creative Commons. So, thank you very much, Alan. Uh, there we go. Questions I can stop and the share and got images. Right. We've got a few questions in there, and uh, we'll start off. Um, it was Owen was the first one to come up with a question. And Owen, are you able to come off mute and uh, ask your question? Indeed, I am. Um, I'm only about for five minutes as of another meeting to run to, but it was something I was really keen to ask. So, in terms of more and more material being available online, you don't know where your students are going to be watching this. Will these exceptions that you use in the UK be, uh, you know, if somebody's watching it in France, if someone's watching it in the US, do you have to worry about their rules? And I think Jamie came up with a good addendum to that about 
whether on whether you've got an online VLE versus one that's hosted in your own country, would that make it a little easier? No, it, well, it adds to complications, Owen. Uh, no two ways about that, but there's only so much we can do uh, as educational establishments to uh, control what our students do. And one of, one of the things that I'm very keen on, and, and some of the colleges have invited me to do it, is to have that conversation with the students. The students, in many cases, are, inc- are, are very well versed in not just um, visual, lit- visual literacy, but a lot of them are pretty good at copyright as well, because it is, um, it is brought home to them in a lot of instances. They see the cases brought up, uh, particularly the musicians, all the stuff that's been going on with uh, copyright of images, you know, the Kardashians, all that kind of thing. It's all relevant. And a lot of the students are able to apply that to what it is that they're doing. Um, I, I wouldn't want to get too hung up on that. I think it's one of those things that within a set terms and conditions that students get when they join the college at matriculation, that there is maybe a little bit of guidance about where they source their material from. But I think you've got to leave it up to them. To be perfectly honest, you can't control it. I mean, that cat's out of the bag. And I just, I would just be concentrating on the individual organisations, the individual colleges, uh, their policies, their procedures, and how they carry out their work. Always trying to be seen to be doing the right thing. Because if they're not, um, you can you can fall into a, a financial penalty trap, you can fall into a reputational penalty trap, but that applies to other aspects of life in colleges as well, health and safety, employment and so on. Copyright is just another part of the legal system. It's just one that particularly interests me and and people like Jason as well, obviously. I'm sorry, that's not the precise answer, but it's not something I would get too worried about. And again, I think can I add that, um, or is it your view that um, actually an awful lot of what comes up as questions is a mainstream and there are potential complications in a lot of areas and uh, sending an exam question in intellectual property laws I did once upon a time um, was always great to come up with contorted situations and really really difficult stuff but the truth is that 99% of the stuff going into teaching and learning materials is actually not too difficult and we can't really concentrate on the difficult cases um, at the expense of allowing us to make best use of the exceptions in the easy cases. Uh, is that fair, Alan? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, the, and the act of making the copy, and so putting other people's materials into teaching and learning materials or using, using it in teaching and learning here. And the good news is you don't have to research every country in the world's copyright uh, because it may be accessed from there. Uh, the act of making the copy is the one that's the, the, the thing that should concern us. Um, and um, you look at UK law for that. Um, and um, there's not been much in the way of change. Uh, Orphan works is my, one of the areas with regards to Brexit, but uh, um, but it's generally the same as it was before Brexit. So, and especially with regards to the exceptions, then it's pretty straightforwardly the same. I think the other thing you've got to consider too is the use that you're going to make of that copy. If you're going to combine the copies and publish your own book and make money out of it, then you've got an issue. But that's not what 99.9% of people who are copying in education want to do. They want to provide good quality, up-to-date information for their students. And the sources for that are myriad these days in comparison to what um, I, I had in my day. It was books. That was it, pure and simple. I mean, I made my reputation at uh, Dundee College uh, as one of the guys who pushed the VHS trolleys around from room to room. Now, for those of you who are far too young to remember what VHS was, it was super at the time. <laughs> it was a brilliant thing. But, God, we had our problems with that as well. But it's, it's a question of intent as well. If you're going to be a pirate, fine. Throw the book at you. You, get, you deserve everything that you get. But, uh, as I say, the vast majority of people, their intentions are very honourable they just want to make life better for their students and make it a, a really good learning experience. I think we, we do get so hung up on uh, the, the, the minutiae sometimes. I, uh, Jason, I know, is on the, I think you're on the List Copy Seek blog or list. I, and some of the detail that comes out of that sometimes, I think, oh, for goodness sake, 
just take the risk. And again, that's something else you've got to consider. We think about the risk, manage the risk, and, and manage the risk by having a policy, by having guidance, by having good training. I mean, there's there's in <laughs> limitless. I've got to stop using big words like Donald Trump tries to use. I, there are limitless resources available these days. It's a question of how well you research for them. It depends upon whether you consider them to be fake or not. You've got to determine the provenance. But hey, that's a professional requirement these days when you're a teacher. Always has been. And on that note of digital literacy and um, and coming to the point of, well, it, there is risk, but uh, risk is something we manage all the time and a matter of judgment can be made to allow us to make most effective use of the exceptions. I'll give my thanks to Alan for giving us um, that overview. It's true that whoever's involved in creating teaching and learning materials must have some uh, awareness of copyright in doing so uh, and call upon others to help them in those tricky cases. Uh, but let's not be afraid to use the exceptions. Thank you, Alan. And I'll bring this virtual bridge session to a close.